Life is good. Um, if you would, look in your bulletin. I'm especially proud of this bulletin because I did it. So, and, and Dow, when we were talking about this at our, our, our Monday morning thing, he said, so you're going to be doing the bulletin? And he said, mm, I'll be watching to see what falls through the cracks. So uh, something may have, but I, I was pretty proud that I could pull all that off. Anyway, uh, if you look in your bulletin, you can see the prayer requests there. We've got uh, several of them. I know uh, Jackie's surgery on her ear w went good, but she's got a headache. She said if it wasn't for the headache, she would be great. So uh, pray about that. You can see the others that are on. We went to see uh, Jim Clough yesterday. I know Dwight and Susan went also, and uh, he's doing well as he's getting over the stroke, so that's good, and the others uh, that are there. We appreciate that. We're going to do something a little different uh, this morning in, in the prayer, opening prayer type thing in time. Uh, and I always ask God about what I should do and not do in the service, and one of the things that God put on my heart was this, that um, if you've got something that's especially on your heart and mind, I mean, there's everybody's got things to pray about, but if there is a special burden on your heart and mind, a special need, especially on your heart and mind, in just a moment, I'm going to have you raise your hand, and I'm going to ask people in the congregation to get around you and find out exactly if you want to share, you don't have to share, and pray for you. And by that, uh, Mr. Piano Man, uh, if you'll just come up and play something while they do that. And I'll give a moment or two for you to get with these people uh, that says, I, I would, it would really encourage me if somebody would come over here with me and pray for me. And since I can't go to each individual, I thought uh, that I would do it that way. But I will before we have those special ones. Uh, does anybody have anything they want the whole congregation to know? Yes. Well, since you brought up the fact that you wanted to go around and take people that needed prayer for specific things, yeah. I was telling several people this morning they know about when I got hurt with the hip. And all that time, I, you know, the doctor couldn't touch it. So it's been almost two years now. But anyway, I had a bone in there. I could tell every time I took a step of the move. In my head. So I was kind of asking God, what in the world, you know, what do I, what's my job to do to get to these things, you know, what can I do to do this? Anyway, I was telling Dow that I got up one day last week and there was no clicking going on with the head. This thing is, since that happened, it hadn't come back. It's just like it's never been hurt. <laughs> And I say this to encourage anybody that needs prayer. Special prayer this morning is working people, and I appreciate all the prayer that I've received from my church family here because I am telling you, <coughs> you don't see the cane this morning. Amen. So I'm trusting it, it's going to get my job is to get it stronger. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, and on that, I'll give you one that was shared with me. Richard was sharing the, uh, about a, a friend of his. I had mouth uh, cancer, cancer in the bone in, in, his, uh, in his mouth and things. And so he'd been having radiation for it and uh, had pretty well burned up everything in his mouth. And the doctors had told him, you know, basically that the skin wasn't going to grow back in his mouth. And Richard, because he's been witnessing to this guy and trying to reach him, said, you know, Dwayne, I've been praying that God would do a supernatural miracle in this is guy's mouth as a testimony to the reality of God. And uh, they got together uh, sometime this week and in talking, uh, he was saying, you know, they told me that the skin wasn't going to grow back in my mouth. He said, but I think I feel it growing in there. And so Richard told him what he had been praying for him about. So we're going to continue to pray that God causes that skin to continue to grow when the doctor said it, it wasn't going to do it. 
And, and I don't discount doctors. Please, uh, if you're in the medical field or watching medical field, doctors give what they know by their human understanding. But um, God is a great physician, and so he's the one that I really want to know the final diagnosis of what's going on here. So um, uh, anything else that somebody uh, says, I want everybody to know before I have people raise their hands specifically be prayed for. Yes. My brother-in-law, Bobby. All right. Pray for Bobby. Thank you for praying for she died. She had cancer too. Right. And Bobby is having brain problems. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Bobby's on our prayer request list, but continue to pray for Bobby England with with the cancer there. I know uh, it's not on on here, but uh, Rosemary McGinnis. You know she's up north trying to help her sister with her mom and dad, and that's a challenge. And and um, you know. Um, I know we have people that were here this morning from um, Christ in Action, and it looks, you know, the difficulties that are still out there that they can't get to because of government red tape and pray for the elections. I mean, there's just so many things to pray for. Yes, yeah, Susan? Lauren Doty asked if we could pray for her mom. Um, she has a, a mass in her abdomen, and they're running some tests, and um, they're hoping to find out a solution to that. Her name is Jill Mark. Jill Mark? <coughs> yes. M-A-R-K? Yes. All right, remember that. All right, what we're going to do now, uh, if you'll come up, Mr. Piano Man, and play... If you say, I really have a, a, something that I would appreciate somebody coming and praying over me about, would you raise your hand? And if you see somebody with a hand raised, would you just get up and go around them and pray? All right, there's one back there. Somebody get up and go around these people. If you want something specifically prayed for, raise your hand and uh, give you a moment. You can go ahead and start playing. Anybody else have anything specific? As you see these hand raised, you prayed for these people. All right? Up here, we got some people. Anybody else have something really specific that you're asking prayer for? It's a special, special burden on your heart. If you're sitting there, pray. You just pray for, for these people and your own needs and the things that are in the bulletin. I want to take the time to pray. I'll give you about a minute or so more if you're praying over the people and then I'm going to have a prayer for all these that are in the bulletin and for the needs that we face. praying around people if you're still praying you can the rest of you uh, we're going to go and I'm, I'm going to pray out loud Father I want to thank you for the power of prayer and it isn't the power of us it's your children admitting how much we need you how desperately in a sin cursed world these things are Lord, I pray for marriages. I pray for those that have strained relationships or even broken relationships. I pray even for those that have divorced but shouldn't have. And that they'll be reconciled. I've seen you do that, Lord, in relationships. Pray for our homes to be strong and godly before you. That family devotions and praying together and coming to church is the pattern and the norm 
Father, I pray for wayward children, whether they be adults or young ones. Thank you, Lord, that we had one that was coming forward and said, I've been talking with parents and stuff, and I want to be saved today. Lord, we thank you for those that are teaching their children the truths and bless this church and ministries that minister to young people so that they can hear truth that brings them to eternal salvation. We pray for adult children that are wayward or off track. Lord, we pray that you will bring truth to their heart and mind and life. We pray for our country that is so desperately we are in need of revival and it starts with your people being desperate and hungry for you to move in our midst and change us so that you can use us to challenge change in others that will preach and teach the gospel bless the ministries and the people of this church Lord as we seek to reach out for you Lord I pray for those that are on the prayer request list thank you that you do the miraculous that you're going to work in the mouth of this friend of Richard's that you are working in Johnny's hip that you are at work for good Lord may we trust you and even when what we want to happen doesn't happen immediately help us to trust in your character and your goodness because you're going to do us right you're that type of God Lord, I pray for every burden, every need of the people who are watching or are here live, Lord. You're a God that answers prayer, and I ask that that be seen and known. And as we look at the message today about the prodigal son, Lord, I pray that you'll bring some prodigal back to you. Thank you for your goodness. We pray your blessings on the offering that we're going to be taking up. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you will go ahead and take up the offering, young people, I'll go. You can sit there. We'll do name that tune in a minute. But I'm going to go ahead and do the announcements. First of all, uh, Open Gym today uh, continues, and it will continue till the end of February. So that's today, all ages. Ladies, you have your ladies' meeting. Uh, snow has gotten it a time or two, but... Uh, from the weather report, rain may be something, but not snow. So uh, y'all come out, ladies, and also teen ladies, young ladies. Uh, y'all come out and be with these uh, ladies and uh, let them download into you what God's taught them. But uh, 6 o'clock is a meal. On Wednesday, for those that are 55 and older here, we're going to have our senior meal. And so you can come out here if you're 55 or older and invite somebody who's 55 or older. Uh, they don't have to go to this church. And uh, we'll have a, a good meal for you uh, there. Um, it's not in the bulletin, but since I'm talking about eating, and y'all know we like to eat. Uh, tonight, we didn't get to do our uh, soccer ba banquet meeting meal thing on Friday night because of the, the snow and the cold. So we're going to be doing it tonight, 6 o'clock. Uh, we're going to have spaghetti and meatballs and a salad and a cake for dessert and tea to drink and rolls and good stuff. So uh, if you've helped in the uh, past uh, with our soccer program, we want you to come. If you are interested in helping in this year, even if it's just the spring season, Please come to the meeting so uh, we can get you plugged in and we can begin getting organized. I had a meeting with Andrew uh, yesterday evening about our website, and we're going to try to have it up and running February 1st where people can begin registering. So it is upon us. And so uh, uh, come tonight if you would like to help in that. Got an Easter cantata meeting, right? Uh, this morning right after church Susan Boston's got the music right there I can see it in the box and um, we had such a good time uh, uh, not only uh, serving the Lord with singing it but we also had a good time at practice we were funny <laughs> we were uh, it was a good time so uh, you may not have got to help with a Christmas one but we're going to try to do an Easter one if we got enough people so uh, plug into that if you would 
You can see about the blood drive, the, uh, the form to fill out. We have to have at least 30 people that are, are saying we will give blood for them to actually pick the date and say we're going to do it. So if, if you know somebody in your community that is uh, somebody who would be willing to give blood, you can sign their name up. But we're still trying to get those uh, signatures together. You can see about the Sweetheart Banquet at Camp Red Arrow. How many of you have ever been to a Sweetheart Banquet at Camp Red Arrow? Have been. Have been. Yeah. We have a good time there and we appreciate it. Um, you can get, get the information. They've got um, information cards out there in the bulletin. But we always have a good time, good meal, uh, good fun in the games, and also a uh, great speaker, even though last year it was me. It's somebody else this year. I don't know who. But anyway, so come on out for that. And then, uh, don't those banners look nice? Yeah. They used them, um, Nancy and her, her elves of uh, Christmas uh, are not just Christmas elves. They're going to, they want to uh, make, uh, I think, an Easter banner or something like that. So uh, it's a banner year. So if you want to come out and help with that, you can see on the 29th at uh, 10 a.m. here, and she'll have all the stuff. You just show up for that. Did I miss any announcements? Yes. If you got your tickets, oh, better stand up. If you got your tickets for the women's uh, conference this Saturday, meet at the church. If you're riding the bus, be here at 7 a.m. because we're going to get there and get good seats. <laughs> All right. Well, that's good. All right. If there are no other announcements, we're going to do name that. Uh, hang on. Uh, before we do name that tune, is anybody new to introduce? Okay, now we'll do name that tune. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. I think it's called Jesus, Joy of Man's Desiring is one of the names of it. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Uh, 38, 38. Uh, you normally hear it as a procession at, at uh, weddings. But uh, it is a wonderful, beautiful Christian song. So, 38, if you want to stay seated, fine. If not, please stand and we'll sing all four, ver four verses. Ready?
You can be seated. I guess the worship team is going to come up now and lead us in some more good worship. Good morning. It's hard to talk and sign at the same time, <laughs> but I'm going to start singing, and you can read the words, Dee Dee. Um, I think this this week um, I had picked out these songs because I thought we were going to have um, com communion, um, but even if we don't, we're focusing on the cross, and um when we go to God, he wants us to surrender our hearts. He wants us to surrender. And I was really thinking about surrendering and giving and what does that mean? What does it mean when you surrender? And I have a friend, and she, she has horses, and the way she describes it, the, the, the way that a horse has to be broken to the rider is the same way that we need to be broken and surrendered to God. Have you ever thought about that? I thought it was really interesting. But I'm just going to pray. Jesus, we thank you that no matter what we do every day, even if we fail you, that you are faithful and you never leave us and you always love us. You loved us first. We just praise you now, and we thank you for what you did on the cross, that you died for us, and you gave us righteousness. We just thank you, and we praise you now, and you stand in Jesus' name, amen, and worship with us. Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from hell. Messiah, the Lord of all. He became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. Oh, 
can be seated. If y'all would, pass those around and I go over what I always go over because I do not, I do not want this to curse anybody. You say you believe in curses? Absolutely. The Bible says that there are things you do that bring curses on your life and there are things you do that bring blessing on your life. And one of the things the scripture says that when you take communion as often as you do it, you do it in remembrance of what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you, but also your heart saying that I want Jesus Christ first place. That's why it's called communion. It's saying, I want to grow closer to the Lord. And Lord, if there is any barrier in my walk with you, show it to me. I don't want it there. I don't want any barrier that would keep me from enjoying the fullness of what you died and rose again for me to have. It could be something as small as you and your mate argued this morning and you hadn't forgiven them yet. And you don't intend to till they say they're sorry. Might have been your kids got on your nerves or your parents got on your nerves as young people. Could be bigger things like pornography or lying or stealing. You hate somebody in your heart. The Bible says that's equal to murder. Maybe some other thing that you have that you haven't said God I don't want this as a part of my life as I've said so many times and I love saying it because the truth of it helps me my sin is no problem to God not bringing my sin to God that's the problem and communion is about saying God show me and so God's saying don't pretend you want to get closer to me unless you're willing to deal with this issue in your life and deal with it doesn't mean you never struggle with it again. It just means that you don't want it a part of your life and you are going to press it to God as it, He gives you grace to get more and more victory over it, more and more regular obedience in those times of temptation. And so if that's your heart desire, then that's why you should take communion. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, don't take communion, but I encourage you, to come and know that Savior who is willing to die on the cross for you. I need one if somebody will give me one. Where's my wife at? No, they've got them. It's an extra one? Well, God knew. Softball coming up. Remember that. If you will, peel back the, the top layer and you'll reveal a wafer. And I always try to explain because some people have been confused. There are a lot of religious ideas about wafers and, and the grape juice and things like this. But the Bible says when you do this, do this as a memorial to remember. It's not the substance itself that is the issue. It's the truth that it illustrates. And the truth was and is and eternally will be that God in the person of Jesus Christ came and he was broken for you. In fact, I don't know whether I did it in undoing it or whatever, my bread is in pieces. And as you take this, you need to remember that not only physically did Jesus Christ suffer because he wants a relationship with you, but he suffered your eternity of hell in a moment of time. Every time I see a flame, whether it's a campfire, a candle, or, or whatever, I think, would I want to be on fire for five seconds, five minutes, five hours, five years, 500 years, and realizing that without Jesus Christ paying for your sins, which he did, he took your eternity of hell in a moment of time. That is what you are choosing for yourself. God doesn't send anybody to hell. They reject the cure for sin, which is a Savior in His name of Jesus Christ. So 
Don't ever believe the lie of Satan that you've gone too far and that he can't reach you. All you have to do is come and accept the fact that he died for you. So with a spirit of thanksgiving, may we take eat the bread. I try to picture in my mind Jesus Christ being beaten with a cat of nine tails in his blood. If you watch Passion of the Christ, you've seen a replica. It can't depict what it was really like. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin, but it is also the promise of a new covenant, a new relationship. The fact that Jesus Christ shed his blood makes it where I can become more than just a creation of God. I can become a child of God. The most amazing father that could ever be is my daddy. And I know as the heart of a father how I want to take care of my children. And it doesn't hold a candle to how much God loves me. And that encourages me. And so as we take drink, remember that you have a loving Heavenly Father that you can run to as a child does to their father with any need. And you may have not had a good father, but this is the perfect father. And those who come to him, he says, he will in no wise cast out. So let us take drink. If you would, pass them to the end of the aisle. And... Uh, I'll have some deacons pick those up. And also, if I'd have the children church workers go to the back. And then young people, you follow out right after them. Appreciate all the young people and all the workers that are a part of that. And once again, if you want to help out with that one time or get on a rotating schedule or something, see Andrew or myself and we'll try to put you on that because we always need workers. Always need workers. All right, we're going to continue our series, but this parable is probably the most familiar parable uh, that, that we could go to uh, in the Bible. In fact, I thought about how relatable it is to, to your life and mine. So if you would turn to Luke chapter 15, and we're going to be looking at the parable of the prodigal son. Um, and thinking about it being relatable, you can think about it from the father's standpoint of having somebody that you love that is gone or is off the reservation, so to speak, or out of whack with God and out of whack with you. And there's a strain in the relationship and they're wayward. Some of us can also uh, relate to being that prodigal. And when we have our men's uh, breakfast and people giving their testimonies, almost always I hear a part of, I went away from the Lord and tried the ways of the world to see if it would satisfy and then came back to him. So a lot of you can relate to the fact of being a prodigal. Sometimes in this story you can relate to all three. Some of you can relate to being the good one who didn't go out and do all those things and, and uh, feel like he's getting what he deserves, you know, if you reject him and, and had a hard heart toward his brother and wanted justice, wanted justice. And uh, sometimes aren't as welcoming and judgmental of, of those that have made mistakes. One of the things that the unsaved world says about Christians is, 
They love to point fingers of those that have had moral failures and beat them over the head with their moral, moral failures so that they can feel superior in some way. We can relate to these type situations. And that's why this is one of the um, more familiar and speaks to the heart parable. But I'm going to look at it from, from some different angles. First of all, I want you to see in, in the section, and I'll just tell the story instead of reading it because there are a lot of it, but it's familiar. So uh, this rich man had two sons. And uh, the younger one said, you know, um, I, I want to get away from home and family. I want to go out on my own. Dad, give us our inheritance before you die. Give me my, my portion, my inheritance when you die, let me get it now because I need it to launch out in what I'm going to do in life. And so the dad gave both of the sons um, their inheritance. We know the younger one, a few days later, went off to a far country and partied, partied, partied until he couldn't party anymore. And the reason he couldn't party anymore is he was out of money and out of people who claimed to be his friends to party with. They left him as soon as the money was gone. And he had nobody, and there was a great famine in the land. And so he was starving to death. And so he became somebody who tended pigs for somebody in that far country. And he had to feed the pigs, and the husk off of the, the grain that he fed the pigs is what he ate. Because nobody gave anything to him. Nobody cared a, a flying flip about him. Fend for yourself, buddy. And so he was trying to sustain life off the husk that the pigs wouldn't eat. Don't know how long it took, but he came into himself and he said, you know what? Every worker in my father's have has more than enough food to eat. Now I'm ashamed of myself and I know that I can't come back as a son, but maybe since I know the farm and know the 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 workings of, of my dad's property, that he'll, he'll hire me on as a, as a worker. And so he left the pigs and went back. And as he's on the horizon, his dad says, the Bible says when he was a far way off, saw him, went running to him. And obviously, if you've ever worked pigs, you're as sloppy as they are. You smell like them. He's probably thin, maybe beard grown, just disheveled in every way. And his dad comes running up, hugging. And the son does what he said. Father, I don't deserve to be your son, but would you hire me on as a worker? And he put the ring, the family crest, so he could do family business. And said, bring the best robe and put it upon him. We're going to have a feast. Son, everything's forgiven. You were lost and now you're found. And then the other brother heard all the commotion of people singing and partying and all this when he was coming in from work and said, what's going on? And one of the people said, oh, your, your brother that was gone, he's, he's back. And it made that older brother mad. That sorry, no good guy running off and doing all this. How he shamed our family and, and now dad's taking him back like nothing. And I'm not going, I'm not going. I'm not going to join into this. And so his dad heard that he was not going to come in and he was outside and upset. So he comes out to him and the older brother said, listen, I've... Work for you. I didn't go running off. I stayed here and I worked the farm. And you never gave me a, a, a kid of the, of the lambs of the goats to, to have to party uh, with my friends and, and rejoice in me. And dad said, listen, you've always been here. And my everything I have is available to you to enjoy. But it's right that we celebrate the fact that your brother has come home. Now, there's some truths in that story, and we're going to look at some specific verses. First of all, I want you to see in the story there's more than one way to be a prodigal. 
Both of the sons in this story were prodigals. One was an obvious prodigal. Self-centered, wanting his money, taking it and running off, leaving the family, having a party lifestyle, drinking women, whatever he wanted. And it was easy to see that he was a prodigal. In fact, we'll see that if you'll put it up there in verse 12. And the younger said to his father, give me the portions of good that followeth me. He divided to them his living. And then he took off. Now, in verse 29, he answered and said to his father, this is the other brother. I've been with you these many years and I've never transgressed. I've always at your commandments and yet you never gave me the kid to make merry with my friends. Both were prodigals because both had a heart problem. Being a prodigal is not about your outward actions. It's about your inward heart. And this second brother was just as much of a prodigal. Though he was somebody who was a prodigal inwardly, but tried to hide it by doing everything right. Do you know that you coming to church does not make you righteous? Do you know that doing all this Bible knowledge doesn't make you righteous in and of itself? All these things are good. This other brother, this other prodigal was just as much a prodigal because he was caught up in religious pride, we would say in a church way. But he was caught up in his pride of, I'm superior to my brother. I'm superior to other people. I do it right. And I condemn anybody who doesn't do it like I do it. But that's not God's heart. That's not what God wants in somebody's heart. So whether you have just absolutely blown it in your life and you're that outward prodigal where you're easily identified, you might be a straight lay, straight arrow, got everything seemingly together, but in your heart you're a prodigal because you are a self-righteous person, which means you don't have any righteousness. And I, know, I want you to see just like this guy, he, in the story of the prodigal, the one that was outwardly a prodigal realized he was a prodigal. The second son, we have no indication in the story that he ever realized he was a prodigal too. So if you're watching and you say, I'm a good person, I'm a good husband, a good wife, I'm a good son, a good daughter, I'm a good worker, I'm a good community person, I don't cheat on my taxes, I don't lie. I do right, but you're trusting in that. That's the greatest sin of all. When the Bible says in Proverbs, what are the seven things God's, God hates? Number one on the list is pride. So are you a prodigal? There are two of them in this story. What's the profile of a prodigal? What does a prodigal look like or what do they do or don't do? First of all, dissatisfaction with life. You already saw in the verses, this is the, the second prodigal. Go back to verse 12. The younger son said, give me the portions that belong to me. I'm unhappy with my life. I'm unhappy with my bank account. I'm unhappy with what I can do. And there is a great dissatisfaction with life. How satisfied are you in your soul with life? Now, I know man's of a few days and full of sorrow. I know this is a sin-cursed world. The Bible also says one of the fruits of God's Spirit in control of you is a spirit of love, of joy, of peace. Of long, you can go through the list. Are you dissatisfied, almost angry at life, that it's not the way you want it to be. And, and you're, you're chasing something. You continually are chasing something. Just like a fisherman, Satan knows what to wiggle in front of you and make you chase till he's got you hooked. And some of you are chasing things of this world to try to make your life worth living. The things that make life worth living are spiritual things. And they are things that only come through surrender and submission to Jesus Christ. But if you're a prodigal, you're dissatisfied. 
You're unhappy with life. You're dissatisfied with this or that. You can just pick marriages, uh, financial things, what you live in, even what you eat, what you drive. You're just a dissatisfied person. But the other guy, go back to the uh, 29, he was dissatisfied too. You never gave me. You never gave me. I wanted to have a kid and party with my friends and have, have a good time with them, but you never gave me. I wonder how long, day after day, was he dissatisfied thinking, Dad, you never do anything for me. You never give me anything so I can enjoy life with my buddies, with my friends. And though outwardly he didn't voice this, God used this situation with his brother to show him the dissatisfaction in his heart. Do you really enjoy coming to church? I enjoy God, but I admit, there have been a lot of times when I was young, I didn't go enjoy going to church because it was boring. God's not boring, but people can present God in a way that's boring. But Mama made us go no matter what, so I was there. But in your heart, was, is there a hunger and a desire? I, I am hungry for Jesus, yes, but I am satisfied with everything Jesus is and does for me. I just want more of him. But if you're dissatisfied in your heart, I would say you're a prodigal. Second thing, distance in relationship with the father. Verse 13, if you'll put that up. This is talking about the first son. And not many days after, the younger son gathered his stuff, took his journey into a far country. I got to get away from dad. How many of you feel like you got to get away from God? One of the signs that somebody is not right with God is their church attendance begins to wax and rain. He said, nah, I know it'd get around to, to saying uh, church attendance because you just want these pews to be filled not for anything patting myself on the back if you're not here it's hard for you to enjoy what God's doing I know we live stream but there's also a fellowship with one another there's something about being here that is more than just watching it online though I'm thankful for people to watch it online but you try to distance yourself ask yourself this question it's something I do on a regular basis has there ever been a point in time in my life where I've been closer to the Lord than right now? If the answer is yes, you're a prodigal. There's some work of coming home that needs to be done. He was dissatisfied, couldn't wait to get away from the rules. If all you think God is rules, you don't know the Father very well. Every rule that God has in this book for me is to bring blessing to my life and to protect me from that which would curse my life. God's not trying to run my life. He's trying to tell me this is the path toward blessing. But when you are a prodigal, you distance yourself from the Father and His Word and His influence. You're uncomfortable when you come to church. You're uncomfortable when people praise Jesus or when somebody seems really excited about God. You're a fanatic. You're weird. And be honest with you, some of them are. But <laughs> you could discount those and you could tell those that are genuinely excited about Jesus Christ because they walk with Him. But you want to get away. So let's see this in the other son, the older son. He was angry and he would not go in. He wouldn't enjoy come in with the father and his brother and the people that were enjoying life. He wanted to stay away from it. Do you know why people drink, take drugs? Because they don't have any joy from God. I can act stupid without drinking. I can have a good time without those things. When people turn to these other things, they're saying, I am not connected to the source that makes life worth living, and I need a substitute. That's why people turn to pornography, drugs, alcohol, money, pleasure, all these things. And so, he was just the same. He was a prodigal. 
that was distant from the Father. I'm not coming in there with you, Dad, because you'll love and accept these people. And I don't, because they blew it. You know, I, I doubt you thought you'd hear this word from the pulpit today, but there's some people out there that have really raunchy lives. I mean, just disgusting. And if they'll come to Jesus, Jesus wraps his arms around them. But we won't. We should. If not, we're a prodigal. Going on, distance in relationship with the Father. Bad relationship choices. Same thing back to 13. Um, and he went to a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. I'm sure he didn't party alone. He found people. And when you're a prodigal, you know what? You'll hang around people who are running from God too. You'll hang around people whose lifestyles are not turning to God, but these things that will not satisfy. You'll make bad choices in your relationships. You'll make bad choices of who you start dating. You'll make bad choices when you get married. You'll make bad choices because you're a prodigal. You're running from God. He's not first place in your life. And God will allow you to think that this person is the answer to my life. <laughs> And you will soon learn that nobody but Jesus is, is somebody you can build your life around. Everybody will disappoint you. Everybody will fail you, and you will fail them. People are the pits, including me. The only one you can trust is God. Pew proverb. And so, bad relationship choices. Who are you hanging around? You say, well, I'm hanging around the rich and famous. I'm hanging around the people who are having a good time in this, this swanky place and we're drinking and we're, we're partying and we're doing all this because I'm going to be a somebody in this country. And you're just wasting it. Bad choices. But the guy who stayed home also had that situation back to, I think it's verse 28 again. He wouldn't go in. There were good people in his house, his dad, people that he worked with on a regular basis, and they were rejoicing in God's goodness, but he wouldn't go in. And so he made bad choices in relationships. He basically chose not to have any. How many close friends do you really have? You know, one of the things about being a Christian is you can have relationship with people who know all your dirty laundry and still know that your dirty laundry is not you. And they love you and they're there for you and they pray with you. One of the wonderful things about what a church should be is that we know every, each other's story, but we know who Jesus Christ created you to be. And his plan for your life is good. And we do not condemn. We build up. Um, next thing, uh, put up Proverbs 13, 15. In the story, as long as he had money and partying, things were good. But as soon as the stuff, the reality set in, and it said that there was a famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Nobody gave to him. Good understanding gives favor, but the way of the transgressor is hard. As you read this story, this guy's living after the, the party lifestyle. What did the party lifestyle do for him? Nothing. It led him to the pig pen. In hard times. You know, as somebody who ministers to people, and, and this has been my life and should be the life of every Christian ministering to people. There's some people in some awful situations. There are, are women who have three different baby daddies and none of them are there to help them with their kids. And it's a mess. You got grandparents that are raising children when they should be just spoiling them like grandparents do, like I do with mine. There are people that 
are living in substandard housing if they have housing at all. We get, I, I got a call this morning from a situation. And hearing the story, it's just heartbreaking what people get themselves into and how it affects them financially, how it affects them physically, how it affects them in their mental health, uh, the, their relationships. The, their lives are a mess. The way of the transgressor is hard. And if your life is especially hard and it seems you have difficulty after difficulty after difficulty, you might want to say, maybe I'm a prodigal. And the things I'm facing, I've brought on myself. And it was the same thing um, with the other brother, though. Uh, this, this is true. The way of the transgressor is hard. Next thing about a prodigal. Emptiness and loneliness. Put up verse 16, please. He wanted to, he, he was stomach growling empty. He had tried to find, to fill with his belly, the husk. But here's the part that uh, I want you to see. And no man gave unto him. Nobody cared about him. He was all alone. Nobody would go to the mat for him and sacrifice for him and get down there with him and try to pull him up. And emptiness and loneliness is part of being a prodigal. Many people that I've talked to that have problem with drinking uh, have always said I had drinking buddies and we would drink together but when I quit drinking they didn't come around misery loves company but that doesn't mean there's a kinship you're just alone in a group one of the things about Walking with the Lord is there is a sense of family and community and belonging and love. And if you're not enjoying that type thing in some form or fashion, you're a prodigal. Same thing with the older brother, verse 31. Uh, but as soon as this thy son was come, as devoured thy living with a harvest, you've killed the fatted calf for him. And in the next verse, 31. And he said to his son, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. The son wasn't enjoying any of that because he felt alone that he couldn't in, uh, have that relationship for his dad to meet those things. There's an element also uh, I want to go to the next one about being a prodigal. Not making the choice to return. Verse 17. Luke 17. And this is the first son. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? My question is this. How long was he feeding pigs, starving to death, before he came to himself. It says, and when he came to himself, one, uh, the next verse says that, and when he came to himself, how long will you not make a right choice to return? He could have realized when the hard times, the famine were coming, oh my, this was a mistake. I need to return home. Dad loves me and he'll take me back. Even though he shouldn't, I'll return home. But he didn't. How long will you continue to hate your life, not enjoy it, not have fullness? God came to give life and give it more abundantly. And once again, it's an internal thing. It's not an external thing. Because the older brother in verse 31, going back to that, you're ever with me, and all I have is thine. Why was he not enjoying that? Why was the older son not enjoying that? He could have at any time went to his dad and said, Dad, would you give me some money? 
Would you give me a kid? I want to have a party for my friends and enjoy them. What would his dad have said? Sure, son. You don't have because you don't go to God and ask. And the reason you don't go to ask is because you know you're not right with God. And you feel ashamed. That's what kept the first son in the pig pen. I don't know how long. It kept him because he was ashamed. And you know what shame is? Pride turned inside out. Let that one sink in. When you're proud but know you have blown it, you're saying, I can't admit that. I don't want anybody to see I've blown it. So I'm going to hide. I'm not going to come and admit. Shame is pride turned inside out. And pride's a problem. And so, not making the choice to return is a sign that you're a prodigal. Today, in, in just a short time, we're going to have an altar call. Whatever is not right between you and God, why wouldn't you come let God fix it? Why would you come Sunday after Sunday knowing you're not right with God? Why? why? I'll tell you why. Because Satan uses pride and things to demonically blind you from the things that will make life full and meaningful and blessed. So, if you're not choosing to return, there's a, a song that I, I've sung, I think, one time here, but I used to sing it a lot when I did camps and Bible schools. You've heard the words and know they're true. For now they ring inside of you. They're calling you to come away. Now will you come or stay? You want to. Now will you. You want to. Now will you. The truths that burn within you like a bed of fiery coals contain the power to liberate a thousand captive souls. But if the truth will ever set you free, depends on you. You want to. Now will you. You want to. Now will you. Prodigals know they need. They know they're in a mess. But they let pride and shame and fear keep them from running to the Father. Now, real quickly, we got to see the Father. The Father, first of all, in verse uh, 11, was he was fair to all. You have a fair God. God is fair. God is not a respecter of persons. He gave when one son asked for his inheritance, he gave it to them both. Can I tell you, you can have everything that a Billy Graham ever had and more with God. You can have everything that the Apostle Paul had and more with God. You can have everything I have with God and more. God's fair to all. Whosoever will may come. God's a whosoever will God. God's fair. God will use these principles if you apply them to your life. He will bless you. Every one of these principles will work with anybody who applies them to their life. God's fair to all. Second thing about the Father. He had a burdened heart. And you see that in verse 20, if you put verse 20 up there. When the prodigal son, first one, came to his father, but when he was a great, great way off, his father saw him. Well, how did his father see him? Because daily he was scanning the horizon with a broken heart, wishing his prodigal would come home. Do you know God's heart is broken over you? He misses you. He misses you. And his heart aches as he watches and thinks about you suffering in a faraway country and what you may be going through and what may be happening to you. And it hurts his heart deeply. Every parent who has a prodigal child knows that ache. You just want them to be okay. 
And until they are, your heart aches. God aches for you. Another thing about the Father. Love and forgiveness. Great way off. He saw him. Ran. Ran. Here's an old guy. And trust me, as an old guy, I know how hard it is to run. It hurts. He had compassion on him. His heart was already there with him on the horizon. The love and forgiveness of God. He fell on his neck and he kissed him. You have no idea how excited God would be if you would come back to him, prodigal. There is nothing but love and forgiveness waiting you. Why would you not run into his arms? Why would you not enjoy the expressions of his love? The prodigal. In this, his dad never said, I forgive you. Did you notice that in the story when he confesses, you know, Dad, I've sinned against you and I, I'm not worthy to be your son and whatever. You never hear the words, I forgive you. You know why? From the very get-go, the dad had forgiven him. Jesus Christ has already paid for any sin you're going to do the rest of your life. He's already paid for it. When he was on the cross, I didn't exist in time and space. How did he die for all my sins? Because he knew every sin I would ever commit and the rebellious soul spirit I was born with. And he died for that. So that he could look at me and said, Son, you should already know I've forgiven you. Jesus has paid for your sins. All you have to do is accept that payment. He is a loving, forgiving God. He is a restoring God. Um, go to verses 22, 23. Uh, the f- father said this. Uh, but the father said, verse 22, but the father said to his servant, bring the best. You cannot believe what God will do with your brokenness if you bring it to God. God will Take it and do the best things with it. Bring the best robe, put it on him. Put the ring on his hand. Put shoes on his feet. He obviously has blisters and they're dirty, but who cares? Shoes. Bring the fatted calf. Kill it. We're going to celebrate. God is a God of restoration. And so... You say it can never be the same again. No, it can be better than it's ever been. Because now you have a heart that understands the heart of your father. He's a restoring God. Joy. Uh, You see about the the verses here. We're going to party. We're going to be merry. For this my son was dead. He's alive again. He's lost and found. And they began to be merry. Joy. 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 God will have all of heaven celebrating when you quit being a prodigal. God has joy. If you want to bless God, then come to Him. Last thing we'll put down before we close. Truth and right. When He dealt with the other son, and He said to him, Listen, son, all that I have is thine. If you'll go to verse 31 and put it up there. He tells him the truth. He said, son, the reason you haven't enjoyed what you feel like you're missing out on is because you've not asked. But, he said, it was meat. It was right that we should make merry and be glad. He told the truth. He said, sure, your brother has blown it, but he's still my son and your brother. It is right for us to forgive him because he was dead in his sins. And now he's right. He was lost and now he's found. It's right. It's the truth. And one of the things about our loving Heavenly Father is he will tell you the truth when you're wrong. Not to condemn you, but to set you free. The parable of the prodigal 
We've all been there, one of the characters or sometimes all three. But it brings us to the question of the parable. Are you going to continue to be a prodigal? When you're coming home, let's pray. Lord, my desire is to see some soul come to know you as Savior and be a prodigal no longer. Lord, my desire is for any person who knows you as Savior that they will not let the lies of Satan keep them in shame or pride or the deception that the world has the answer. May the emptiness of their own soul or the difficulties that they have in life help them realize they've been making the choices that prodigals make. Instead, in humbly coming home to the Father and opening themselves up to enjoy the fullness of his mercy and love and forgiveness. Lord, this world is such a mess. They need to hear the difference that you make in our lives of restoration. They need to see that you're in the restoring business. And so, Father, may this church, may we, when we go out uh, in the community, be a testimony that you are a loving heavenly father ready to forgive if people will but surrender and humble themselves to you. Do the work in the invitation that you want to do. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The altar is open.
It's a done deal. God loves you. It'll never stop. The question is, do you love him? Let's stand for dismissal. Lord, as we go out these doors, let the world see that you live in us and we have a relationship with you and may they want you so that they can have what we have with you. Thank you for your blessings on this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't forget those of you in the music, come forward and you'll have a quick meeting.